Hello again, Gooners. It's me. I'm back again. I should call myself the Lone Cannon, I think, instead of the Loose Cannon. But anyway, well, on my own, I watched All or Nothing. Yes, the second set of episodes, which begins with episode four, continues on to episode six. Can't really get enough of it. I probably you couldn't say the same about the theme tune, so I'll stop right there. And I'll tell you what, I'll launch straight into it because I haven't got a lot of time. So I will talk as long as I have time, probably. Okay, so episode four, what did I think of that? It begins pretty dramatically because it was the end of the Ober Mayang. I can never say his name. I don't know why. Ober's, Ober's captaincy was over. And uh, it, it was the start of his exile from the club because he was training alone. So he was coming into the training ground, at least, and not really seeing too many people. He was in I- splendid isolation, which wasn't that splendid. A lot of people ask me about Obo and how do I feel about him, given what happened. My answer is he's still a legend, still one of my favourite players of all time. The problem for me is, obviously, he broke the rules. Um, that in itself <laughs> wouldn't necessarily be a problem, but Mikel Arteta is the one who makes the rules. And... Um, Miko Arteta on the show said that he made a lot of compromises to keep um, over at the club. But I'd imagine, but we don't know, I'd imagine that's to do with um, going home sometimes, leaving the country to visit family. So anyway, um, I think the club did the right thing back in the boss, El Boss, as I often call him. And um, I also, of course, when it comes to Arteta, I can't forget how exemplary he's been when he first arrived, he arrived at a time when Arsenal needed him as a player and, and it wasn't just him. Obviously, Mertesacker came at the same time and they turned things around on the pitch when things were going dramatically wrong. And I feel he's done pretty much the same as a manager. Obviously, winning the FA Cup wasn't the worst thing of all time, was it? For a, for a guy that's supposedly a rookie, doesn't seem like a rookie. Based on this programme, there are going to be a lot of clubs chasing Mikko Arteta, in my opinion. So it's a good job, really, that the club backed him. Um, the episode, episode four, documented how it really was the last straw with Ober, who returned um, returned home after getting leave. And he returned home, didn't, didn't turn up for training, was late. Um, and this was well documented by, um, by Arteta, who, who put together a dossier. <laughs> Sounds a bit extreme, but... Actually, in an employment situation, sometimes you have to do that. If you have um, a member of staff who's continually breaking rules, it will affect staff morale in the end. And um, in a sense, football clubs like any other business. So obviously the decision to out Ober, even though not all of us were happy about it, even the players, Ramsdale didn't seem too happy, but accepted it because Artessa's the boss. Um Some of the uh, other players said he's got cojones, which is what, um, who was it who said that? Troy Deeney said that the players lacked it. Well, the manager certainly doesn't. Um, You wouldn't want to mess with Arteta, let's be honest. He's a lovely guy, but you wouldn't want to mess with him. Don't cross him and everything will be fine. He'll back the players as long as they're pulling their weight. And Oberg clearly wasn't um, at that stage. So that decision anyway to out him certainly was vindicated by results. Uh, but the episode ends on a low point. Arteta gets COVID. Gabriel gets sent off unjustifiably against Manchester City. And it ends up um, as, a, as a really unjustifiable, can I call it that, uh, unlucky defeat against Manchester City. Arteta said when he was speaking to the cameras, uh, sorry, speaking to the players through, through his uh, camera, he said that how proud he was of the performance. And I remember as well, that's how a lot of Arsenal fans felt about that performance against City, even though it was a defeat. Um, And the other thing to come out of that episode was Martinelli. Martinelli, hardworking and humble are the adjectives that apply to him. And um, I've got to be honest, I got it wrong when it came to Martinelli, because when I first saw him in a friendly game, I think he scored, actually. But I wasn't impressed aside from that. And I, and I really should have been, but I wasn't. I, he was playing on the right wing. I think he's more effective on the left. Not that that's an excuse for me not realising how talented he is. Anyway, we move on now to episode five. I found this a bit disappointing compared to episode four because um, 
I don't know. It just didn't seem to have the same level of drama, even though Oba was finally out of the door. He broke club rules yet again, arriving in Barcelona ahead of a deal. And it only went through at the 11th hour. The, the clock was ticking. Um, Edu, Edu seemed pretty quiet, actually. Um, every time I've seen him, he seems relatively quiet compared to Arteta. Arteta comes out of it really dignified, I feel. Edu's the realist. He tells Barca they're living in Disneyland if they're trying to tell him that Obo is simply in that Spanish city to see his family. So apparently Obo should have been at the training ground training by himself, of course. Another thing that comes out of this is Lacazette. To me, he's always been an unsung hero. I know he's not everybody's favourite. I don't quite know why, though. I think he always worked hard for the team. He wouldn't have been made captain otherwise. Although, when we're talking about working hard, there's something I haven't really covered, but there were four players that Arteta singled out, I think, when he still had COVID and he was watching the training from home. He said there were four players not putting it in. He never named those four players, so it'd be interesting to know who you think they are. I, I'm i not really sure, to be honest, because Obo has already gone at this point, I believe. So who were those four players that weren't putting it in? Did he, did he offload those players? Who knows? Anyway, it's, it's certainly food for thought. Anyway, going back to Lacazette, um, January, January uh, this year was a time of, of a lack of, lack of goals, a bit like the lack of water now. So it was um, Lacazette, for me, really got the ball rolling. He set up Gabriel for the only goal of the game against Wolves. And um, in a previous episode, I really felt that Lacazette didn't get as much attention as he deserved. Um, it's almost as if he was being airbrushed out of history, <laughs> I was thinking. A bit like uh, Kolasinac, who, um, who was only on screen so briefly as he went out the exit door. Blink and you miss it, he's gone during that winter transfer window. Granite Shaka came out of it really well. Um, he was trying to get Saka to say thank you to him for a silly red card he picked up um, when he made a really reckless challenge. There's no way in the world he shouldn't have walked for that. Um, I can't see it from Shaka's point of view. A little bit like the way the fans, the fans are sort of backing him over the yellow card he picked up against Palace. I can't back him on that. I, I think if you if you dive, if you pretend to get fouled, then what can you expect other than a yellow card? It was absolutely stupid. But Shaq is very lovable, and I think I think that comes over in the in these episodes. And all the players, pretty much all the ones that get any any real screen time, come across as lovable. Even though Oba was out the door, he still comes across to me. And I think I think it's genuine. I think they really are. Maybe I'm naive, but I actually think these footballers, as they say, they're human beings. And they're the kind of human beings you'd want to spend spend a bit of time with. And I don't say that about everyone, everybody, to be honest. So, um, yeah, it was quite a funny moment when Shaka was trying to get Saka to say thank you for getting a red card. And he and Shaka just said, look, it would have been um, would have been a goal if I didn't do what I did. So please say thank you. And then he, he just walked out. Uh, but before he walked out, he said, yeah, I do accept the blame, actually. So I think he's a bit of a character. Uh, I would like him to learn from his mistakes. Obviously, we've got to be happy he didn't get a red card against Palace. But he never looked like he would, actually. So perhaps he did learn. So um, I think another thing about Shaka that came out is he does care about the club. And he's got a lovely family supporting him, too. So all of this, all of this um, I, think, I think, makes the fans realise that these players are human beings and shouldn't be slaughtered. Um, Ivan Tony's kickabout tweet as a motivational tool to get the team riled up against Brentford. It was only a 2-1 win, uh, not the most convincing performance. Uh, later on, we see Arteta's family, so the, the, the uh, all-or-nothing team had already looked at Granite Shackers. Now we got, we got to see Arteta at home. We saw him in the, with his wife and three sons. Again, very supportive family. And um, they come out of it so well. Uh, Lacazette, um, came out of it as well also because he was 
he was getting a bit more bit more uh, footage. He was confronting Smith Rowe about what I would describe as tasteless trainers. That was quite amusing. And uh, he gets told by Steve Round, they have a, a session together. Um, it's in this sort of cinema room, I would call it. And he gets told he, he has to watch Benzema. And he, has, he gets told he's got to be more selfish in front of goal. And, um, yeah, I'm not really sure if Laka was taking it on board. Maybe that's why he's been, um, been allowed to leave. His magic beanie hat didn't really help him hit the net. But my, my view, he should have got the goal. Um, he should have been credited with a goal um, against um, against Wolves when it was a one. We went down. Uh, Arsenal went down one nil to a Huang effort. Then Pepe came on as a sub, drew, uh, you know, got got us level, and then finally Lacquer delivers. It was a deflection. To me, that's his goal. Why do they take these goals away? It make, only makes his statistics look terrible. And then also. Run right after that, Ramsdale gets an injury. He's never had a significant one in, in his career before, so he took it pretty badly, as, as you'd expect. But Leno deputised, and, um, and I felt at the time he should have stayed between the sticks because I think when Ramsdale came back, he wasn't maybe fully fit. I don't know, but it just seemed he wasn't the same old Ramsdale when, after the injury. He is now, but he wasn't at that time. And then people complained that Ramsdale's form had gone off a bit, which it had. Couldn't, couldn't say it hadn't. But the thing is, I, as I said, my theory was he was carrying an injury. Leno was absolutely outstanding at Villa, as was Ben White. And he was, the word used was he was immense in that game. There was quite a lot of footage on Ben White too. And, and yet again, another Arsenal player comes out of it, um, seeming like the sort of guy you, you'd want to spend a bit of time with me personally anyway I, I was so impressed with that so I'm going to leave it there because I'm in a bit of a rush but hopefully you've got something out of that I don't know what <laughs> but until the next time adios amigos <laughs>